present. Uh, today I'm going to present to you uh, a research that I'm starting about the European identity across state borders and more preci precisely what can be the, the backgrounds and the type of discourses which can be developed in Europe concerning the European identity discourses which can be named a way to designate uh, the way of being in Europe. So I will present first the general introductions of my presentation. Uh, first of all, I think it is important to look at uh, how cultural identities are built up. So there are an interaction between two, three processes, a process of designations, set presentation, set perceptions and presentations, but there are also different la layers of uh, identities and uh, different ways of being in society and identity is also a way to be like others or to be different like others from others and uh, it is always something related to a certain level of crisis of identity. Then I will go on with the European identity looking at, at it at the, at the broad scale and how EU institutions have developed a designation of what the European identity is and then to look at how Europeans present themselves as Europeans and how, what sort of identity they put forward. And uh, at the third point of this European identity, I will make a focus on Euroscepticism, which is one aspect of the European identity, and uh, how some uh, populist leaders and parties use identity to create antagonism in Europe. Finally, I will look at more at European identities within cross-border regions and how what sort of designation, what sort of discourses on identity is defined by cross-border institutions, what sort of different categories of designations are existing, and I will finish it by a focus on the Greta region, which is a, a cross-border area centered on Luxembourg. So designation, presentation, and self-perceptions. I will uh, put a lot of emphasis on the work of uh, Ms. Einisch, who wrote a book in 2018 on what is not identity. And she put forward this uh, idea of uh, three parallel and interactive process which define what cultural identity is about. First of all, there is the designation by others, that is to say, all the narratives which are produced on identities and how these uh, discourses are received. So you have different type of designations. There's firstly disqualifying designation to, to talk badly about certain people or certain classes or certain individuals which create a dissonance between the people who mention this discourse and people who receive it. Then there is another type of dissonance which is related to uh, excessive positive values expressed by people mentioning identities and people receiving it. And finally there is sort of a coherence existing when there is uh, a positive discourse developed by individuals concerning certain groups, certain beings and which is uh, received normally by the receivers of the schools. Then there is a presentation by the people, the way they present themselves. And uh, as for the designations, the presentations is not necessarily positively received by the people who get this message. Um, it's not necessarily accepted by people who receive the message. If I say, for instance, I am French and uh, people in front of me can say, no, you are not French because of that, because of this, okay. So there is not an acceptation necessarily. And then there might be some strategic attitudes of people saying what they are and adding some specificity of their identity to depending on the people they are talking to, people they want the message to, to be received. So uh, 
but even if we can hide some things, there's always like some aspect of, of identity which can go through, which could be associated to the bourdieu's and habitus of the way of being in society. And then there is the self-perceptions. Self-perceptions are exist when there is a dissonance that I mentioned earlier, dissonance of, in the designations, or even in the presentation when the message is not accepted. And then it's the way when you look at yourself in the mirror in the morning and you, you try to find out what people said about you, how you presented yourself, hiding or lying about who you are deeply inside. And so there is always like a, a confrontation between you and the others and so self-perception exists, which is very hard to, to assess, to know, because we, it's just a very individual things. Then identity, as I said, is a result of this interactive process between designation, presentations, and self-perceptions within uh, a, di a given space and within a given time. Then, of course, when we look at identities, and especially a lot of ge geographers in this room, we, we like to talk about territor territorial identities, how the way of being can be associated to specific territories. And there is a direct uh, territorial identity, like for instance, if you belong to a nation state, then you are associated to a specific territory. But then even there, there are indirect territorial identities, for instance, if you are uh, a scientist in France, or if you are a scientist in, um, in Germany or in Britain, you, have, you share things across the nation state, but there is also a very strong uh, state containment of professions. It can be for journalists, or it can be for teachers, or any type of professions, for instance, have a direct, indirect, sorry, an indirect territorial identity. Then, when we think about territorial identity, especially at the European level, we can see them as like a Russian dolls type of identity. You, are, you have a, a local identity, you've got a regional identity, you've got a national identity, you've got a European identity, and often in the, in the questionnaires sent by uh, in a European institution, or even at national level, they ask you, but who do you feel the strongest boundaries with your commune, with your region, with your state, with Europe. And as a matter of fact, it's a bit of everything, but there is this uh, slightly bordered identities which are built up uh, constantly. And then we've got this cosmopolitan identities, uh, which is a way to uh, go beyond uh, the territorial bonded identities and to relate to other groups across state borders and to have a, a reflexive way to, to consider others and to accept otherness. Then these uh, identities are changing through your life trajectories. It also related to specific generations. If you are French today, if you are French uh, a few decades ago, you don't have the same way to consider yourself as French. Uh, depending also on your media, on your social class, different ways to consider it yourself. And uh, depending on the people you interact with, with your family, with your friends, with your colleagues at work, you don't have the same way to present who you are and to which, which groups you belong to. And finally, the way you present yourselves, the way also how to react to specific events in society or the international scale and especially media events. So, in fact, uh, people, individuals or communities are, as we would say, laïr, plural actors. Uh, they belong to heterogeneous and uh, social groups, as I said, class, professions, type of uh, backgrounds, and, and uh, in, these, in the current time of, uh, of the uh, modernity, there is this ability of communities to be very flexible, to, to belong to like cherry picking, if you want, way of, of being in the, within groups. And so they, they built up a, a stock of dispositions to, 
secure their inclusions to specific communities, which was not so much the case uh, in the past, in the first part of modernity. So then there is also a very another important aspect of identities. It is this double intertwined definition of individuals and groups. We uh, say who we are uh, by saying who we are not. So it is this ipse dimension of identity. We are we are what we are because we are different from them. And so there is also a second way of, of developing discourse on identity. It's about uh, what we have in common. So it is the hidden aspect of uh, identity. And the two exist and uh, there is this parallel process of dis distinctions which can be related to Claudia or this process of imitations which is related to the um, so French sociologist of the late 19th century, Gabriel Tard, was in those days more famous than Emile Durkheim of the other French sociologists. And of course, this uh, assimilation and differentiations is sometimes associated to territorial attachment. And behind this territorial atten attachment, there is always like institutions uh, creating a, a cognitions to know to know in which area you are, how do you, what's the name of the area, what are the borders of the area, how to know this area. And uh, in parallel, you have different ways of uh, creating emotions to this area and to, by developing symbols and cultural bonds, unified languages, um, flags, or any type of ways to uh, being in a, to have a an effect, an affect, sorry, an affect, an emotional bond to specific areas, and finally, this uh, identity related to certain territories is related to your daily routines in a given space. So let's say a space of actions. So territorial attachments and identity is is there are three uh, slices or three. Uh, different spaces, cognitions, emotions, and actions. And of, of course, the most famous identity we, we, we know about, about this uh, national imagined, com imagined communities of the border states, as said Anderson, and uh, in which the assimilation differentiation is structured by the special, spatial borders of the nation states, and uh, Within these state containers, you had they have developed a series of institutions like schools, mass media, who created special bonds of who we are, us, and what, where, what are the others, and different ways to build up hot nationalism to a more mundane banal nationalism in in today Europe. So, uh, to finish on this side of assimilation and differentiations, to go back to Einish, it is important to say that there is no expression of identities without a crisis of identities. Um, there is the identity of minorities who really express themselves when they feel they, they request a greater respect for differences and for their singularity in, in society for groups. And and then there is the identity of majorities who feel that their, their dominance in society, the homogeneity of society is decreasing. So that there is a collapse of their world. So there is this identity of majority which is used in some ways by some populist parties in, in Europe now. And um, so this tension, this crisis of identity is, is linked to this um, dissonance between the designations, the presentation of people and the self-reflections of individuals. If we go to the uh, designations proposed, developed by EU institution, institutional stakeholders, what do we see first? That the identity discourse by the EU institutions, the IPSE discourse is to say we are not like them, or the idem discourse, we are like 
things in common. They always appear in Europe in the European discourse when there is a crisis. And the first time when the identity was put in the agenda of the institutions was in 1973 with the Declaration of Copenhagen. And this Declaration of Copenhagen came in a dual, or at least one crisis and one interrogation. The crisis was the international crisis with the old crisis. When the economy started to collapse everywhere at the world level, <coughs> a new era of capitalism is coming. And um, so a lot of states are wondering what's going to be the next step. And the, the EU is in the way of integrations and they develop it. But they develop it in 1973 when uh, the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Denmark enters the, the EU. Well, Community or open things, and it was also a way to say, okay, you are in Europe. We have things in common. We are different from the rest of the world, and so it was also a way towards Britain to say, you have the Commonwealth, but you are also now in Europe, and so Europe is not a Commonwealth. And, uh, there are more things than economics. There are also cultural issues, identity issues. We have things in common. So that was the first time in 1973 when it appeared. Then, uh, when the European Union uh, number of uh, countries joining in increased, there were different ways, different attitudes by the European institutions. When southern European countries entered uh, Europe, Spain or Portugal, there was nothing really about identity. But when Eastern Europe entered, all the Eastern European countries entered in Europe, then there was also another thing to say, okay, uh, Europe is not just about business, it's about identity. We have things in common and um, we, we are different from the others. What we see that uh, the identity discourse in Europe came always in a time of big changes when the whole Eastern Bloc entered the EU, when the UK entered the EU, when there is the old crisis at the international level. All Earlier, when there is a single market with the dollar commission, say, okay, we love the identity issue. When there was a constitution debate and the negative referendum, say, oh, there is a uh, cultural issue about it. Or the referendum, different referendums. The Brexit referendum, say, okay, see, Britain is living, there is something wrong. The Europe is not just about the economy, there is something else. And, um, during the commission of Prodi, uh, there was a, a group which was created called the Re Reflection Group on the Spiritual and Cultural Dimension of Europe. And um, they also discussed about the Christian roots and about different values of Europe. And they, they came to the conclusion that it was impossible to get uh, a fixed and uh, unique definition of what the European Europe identity is and will be forever and again. It was always about a process of negotiations. If the language of Europe is translation of or interpretaria, because it's not like a common language, the, the identity of Europe is mainly a negotiation between a series of identities existing in Europe. Uh, then you see that having said that uh, for the European institutions, the European identity had different meanings over time. First, there was a discourse of homogeneity, and progressively we went to this idea of unity and diversity. That, of course, we see Prodi Commission with a reflection group on spiritual and cultural dimensions that came progressively, but it can also be related to economic policies behind it, you know, and uh, we are united, but uh, we can do whatever we want, for instance, in the communication sector. But it would be too long to develop. But then there were two parallel designations. The first one is about the heritage ethnic dimension of Europe. Who we are, uh, we see the civilization issue, we see uh, the religion issues, the architectural, the different aspect of the history of Europe and uh, then there is more 
the political identity of Europe, or the what um, uh, was named the uh, constitutional patri patriotism. Uh, then that that is the two really big designations of Europe, and uh, there are different ways to create this ethnic heritage aspect or political community aspect. To, to, if we follow, for instance, EDER, you can have like a, a supra-national European identity, a post-national European identity, or transnational Europe, uh, European identity. The supra-national European identity is about uh, saying there is something else which is really not related to European states. European nation states, which is really specific to the European Union, sort of uh, denying nations in, the, in Europe. This is a supranational identity. The post national identity of Europe is more to, to relate different national stories in Europe and to come up with uh, something else, which is like a recognition of national and the regional. Uh, differences in Europe and the transnational identity of Europe is more to say okay uh, there are nations there are like territorial identities and ter territorialized groups but in between these territorial groups there are so groups crossing the borders like for instance social classes or intellectuals or and um, we there are especially people who can be brokers between nation states and uh, who can uh, rely, connect, link different nations and so there is this transnational ways of, um, of being in Europe and I will detail later on to give examples of what can be supra, post and transnational identity buildings by the European institutions. And we should also never forget that the, when <coughs> Robert Schumann was minister, minister of the Foreign Affairs in France, when there was this European coal and steel community in the making, he considered that the capitalism economics was a, the leaven from which may grow a wider and deeper community. He didn't mention the the words identity or cultural identity but this is very important because it was also a way to consider that if the nations that economies are so imbricated that there cannot be any contentions wars in the future between European nations between this confrontation of nation, national identities and national states so when we look at uh, the policy of the European Union the way the discourse they make, but also the actions following the discourses, what would be the supranational rescaling of identities from the European flag, you got the all to joy in of the EU, you got the currency of Europe, which is not like a national currency, it's really something above nations. You got the Schengen border control, which is there is a common border for all Europeans. And so there are different ways of doing this supranational rescaling, mm -hmm. but there are also uh, post-national ways of building up Europe. I will take just two examples. There is this Museum of Europe, which is developed. There is a way of how we can think the history of Europe beyond nation states. And now even in France, you've got like, historians looking at the history of France, for instance, from a global perspective, so there is a way of considering uh, aspects, but also on more not trivial but institutional ways, got this European presidency of uh, the Council of Europe turning things. So there is always like nation state which is presiding, and the others are recognizing this the importance of this nation state. state. So there is this post-national Europe, and there is this transnational Europe. One aspect of this transnational Europe is the European capital of cultures in which you got artists, you got publics, artists crossing borders and going to specific cities to give uh, like 
platforming us and the public, mainly while well, coming from different parts of Europe, are attending this, these issues. And so the European Capital of Culture is a way to build up a transnational Europe. Then the presentation of Europe's, of Europeans. Uh, there were different ways to look at it. First, there is this uh, evolving quantitative and qualitative assessment of European identity. There is this standard Eurobarometer. And what the standard Eurobarometer look at is really European citizenship. It's not really the European ethnic uh, uh, cultural aspect of it, but it's really citizenship, the political belonging to Europe. And so on, your, on a yearly basis they ask you, do you feel you have a European citizenship and there is this percentage. Then there were also special Eurobarometers, the sense of belonging in 2004, the cultural heritage and the connections to cultural heritage <coughs> during two dates. You got the cross-border cooperation in 2015 in which you ask what is your trust relations across the border and so on. You can, you can look at how Europeans define themselves uh, on different things. And in parallel to these European Eurobarometers, we've got specific programs, we've got the European the Europe Agenda of Cult for Culture, in which different Europeans build up ideas, come up with projects with, and expressing a way of being Europeans. And also you've got the European Citizen Initiative in which Europeans can join together to to propose different things at the European levels. Then, uh, what is the results of this now European age of unity in the diversity across the borders in Europe? You can see there are differences between countries and issues. You've got more pro-European countries and more Eurosceptic countries and others. You see, the UK has always been like more on the Eurosceptic side and countries like uh, Luxembourg, Italy, France were more like on the pro-European side. You also see some differences depending on social classes. The elites are more pro-Europeans and the lower social classes. Um, but also it also depends on the, on the timing and the context when there is a phase of, of, phase of crisis in Europe. The relationship to Europe is not necessarily good. Or it's, uh, it's about, it depends. It depends on countries and social classes and so on. And we should always also consider uh, the works of, of Bourdieu of 1978 to say that the, the public opinion do not exist in a, in a way. Um, the fact that the agenda of <coughs> asking questions to people at national level or European levels is often built up by observers. And they ask questions that people themselves do not never really ask themselves beforehand. So they don't have, they come up with uh, certain answers without really having strong reflections uh, with a lot of thinking behind it, behind it. So is there a pre-existing public opinion in Europe or is there simply a construction of a public European in Europe based on <coughs> the interest of the ob observers in Europe? So this is a very, I think, very important issue. And um, we should also never forget that depending on who you are in front of you, you won't present yourself in the same way if there is somebody coming from the Eurobarometer asking you what you think about an issue, if there is somebody from the Eurobarometer. So having an idea that the Euro integration is a way forward. So you always adapt yourself to the people you are confronting with. And at the end, we keep this uh, public opinion building uh, by uh, opinion polls and so on. They can favor a certain consensual middle ground, say, well, I rather agree with what you say, or I rather disagree with what you say, but I'm not really against totally what you say, or I'm totally in favor of what you say. It's always this consensual middle ground which can be built up, and which is seen often in the Eurobarometers. Then, to, to, to my last uh, slide on the, the European broader scale, 
this issue of Euroscepticism and populist antagonism. And there is a lot of uh, European identity behind it. So, uh, first, this Eurosceptic identity in Europe, the feelings in Europe, has been measured since the late 1990s with the Eurobarometers. You can see people can be like less Euro Eurofied, but then also it can change from years to years, from countries to countries. You see also the, the results of the European elections. People don't vote for European elections. Or in European elections, the Eurosceptic parties are the way of a lot of people are indifferent to it. They just grow. And not just now, but it has been the case over the long time. And uh, the reaction to, of the European institutions to this crisis of Euroscepticism has been to be more transparent and to be more democratic. But as a matter of fact, didn't change too much because you see now is a populist crisis in, in Europe. Then the, the populist uh, parties and leaders have developed um, like a discourse of a European identity of people in Europe and create a series of antagonism related to state borders. They came up with this idea they have like uh, there is a, a bonded, relatively pure, uh, genuine national or regional people, which is versus a betraying um, mobile elite who, who is not really caring too much about the, the people who, which is still within the United States. And then there is also this issue there is a, a democratic, sovereign, bonded state versus the undemocratic, upper level bodies, which are not really uh, nice. And then there is this state controlled market economy versus a global, very aggressive neoliberal capitalism. So, the different ways of creating antagonism by populist parties in Europe, the, I would say the opposition between classes, the people and the elite, uh, the state versus uh, non democratic bodies, and the economy also. But there is also a cultural aspect of it. And this is the way how this uh, growth of populism now exists. It is the issue of uh, migrants, the migrant threats, the cultural threats of migrants. And then you've got different types of uh, ways to, to create antagonism between Europeans and non Europeans. This is the, the Ipse things. We are who we are because we are not migrants. First, there is a conservative antagonism, the Christian. Europe is Christian, past and present. And uh, then migrants, they are Muslims, they are coming from non-Christian countries. So this is one aspect of things which can be seen in a lot of uh, uh, populist parties, right-wing populist parties, and Muslim, uh, the Then there is the liberal antagonism. The same party who can be very conservative on Christianity and Islam, they can also give you an idea that there is women and LGBT rights in Europe. And then you've got this very intoler intolerant men coming from the outside who can threat the rights of women and LGBT rights. This is this liberal antagonism. And then, as we say, Bowman, uh, Zygmunt Bowman, uh, the way of accepting otherness, you have to absorb them or you vomit them. That was the way nation states have been built up of, like interreaching communities, and then if you cannot assimilate them, then it's uh, that out of the of the group, out of the community. And it's also something you can hear about now with populist party that is impossible assimilations of the others coming outside Europe. So and we can see that there is a, a growing success of this uh, populist designations to create a fortress Europe. Um, there is a, a Europeanization of populist strategies in Europe. You can see it now with Salvini. We mentioned a lot about the, the League of Links uh, and populist parties in Europe to defend sovereign state and sovereign people, to protect the people with strong borders. 
But you see, all of these strategies exist in the European Parliaments, even if there are some divisions between parties. Uh, this populist designation of what Europe is, what Europeans are, really attract the interest of the mass media, not necessarily to say it's good, but it is so um, like uh, uh, abrasive, so so big that the media needs to to focus on things which can attract the attention, to attract debate. So this designation is quite important. And then, okay, of course, the growing success of populist parties in national and European elections. And common ground they say there would be a big type of uh, European populist parties, especially right wing populist parties, in the next European Parliament. So now, if we look at the uh, the strength of the designation in cross-border regions. <coughs> cross-border regions are not really at the center of the European agenda compared to other issues, uh, economic issues, social issues. But when we look at the uh, one of the reports of the European Commission very recent, they said that 40% of the EU territory is actually in a cross-border region. 30% of the European population and 30% of the European GDP is located in Europe borderlands and in this area there are about 2 million cross-border workers so it's a, it's a very a big chunk of the European Union is located in Europe borderlands then when we look at these cross-border regions there, there has been a process of developing a a cognition concerning these, these areas, creating a new bordering and to develop discourses about what these territories are and in a way what people in these areas are. First there is the Interreg inter Aid document and, uh, and the following projects in which we develop discourse on different aspects of communities in these areas and what they are and then, in parallel with this interreg funding, creating a lot of discourse about these regions, there is the exponential growth of cross-border regions and institutions. We also create a lot of discourse across the border to say to, to give a certain ways to present the area in which people are living. And you also have all the multiple uh, platforms promoting cross-border regions. The MOT in France, the REPR, the SESCI, the Committee of Regions, they develop a lot of uh, discourse on these cross border regions. And you can have different type of motives behind this, behind the European identity designation in cross border regions. First, there is the interreg funding attractions. Uh, to justify the use of the European money, you can not just say, okay, we need money. We, we get it. We have to say that yes, we are Europeans, and so we we share something in common, and we need to build up something thanks to the money of the European Union. Uh, then there is a political seductions. Um, the political sphere is made of people who have developed careers, and the way to develop discourse on cross-border Europe is also a way to for them to reposition in the, the political fields, in their nations, or across the nation, at the European level. And uh, if you take, for instance, uh, Orban in Hungary, he has developed a lot of discourse on being Hungarians across the border of the Hungarian states, especially in Romania, where it's got this uh, uh, yearly events of Hungarians in Romania, in which he comes and he gives, he gives sort of a set of the unions for Hungarians about what the future of Europe will be or what are the threats. So some politicians can cross more or less easily the borders to for to develop their personal trajectories within uh, public bodies. And then there is also this functional integration. So the, the fact that to go back to the uh, the Schumannian aspect of identity is consider that there is this economic integrations, but we are not just about like uh, 
homo economicus. We are also people, uh, culture, we have like citizens, we vote, we are not just like uh, economic stakeholders. So it can be also a way to justify this economic integration, to create less war, more comprehensions between people. But then we also have a, a limited awareness of the people living in these areas, how they present themselves, do they connect to this cosmic religion? What is the, the attitudes of people living in this area? And uh, a lot of researchers I haven't seated them there say that well, a lot of cosmic regions are in fact invented by special planners. And some of them to get European funding, some of them for political reasons, but there is no really real like strong emotions of people living across the border for specific cross border regions. Um, then when we look at the Eurobarometer of cross border corporations, we can see that there is there can be an ambivalent trust relations among Europeans living in this, in this in border regions. The, the trust of people living across the border. Then there was also a very interesting uh, survey in the greater regions I will mention later on and uh, in 2006 there was uh, a questionnaire sent to the people living in the greater regions and uh, they were asked to people what are the main what should be the greatest objectives of the cross border cooperation in the greater region and okay people uh, mentioned Economy, the cooperation in the economy, but the most important issue for people living in the greater regions is to get border, border control to fight against criminals. So it's not really about cultural and to develop cultural projects across the border. Only like one or two percent of the people living in this area mentioned we should get greater cultural cooperation, which was more about to fight against criminals in the border region crossing the border easily. Then, uh, so the question that we can ask to yourself, so what sort of um, uh, identity designation is developing for, for the region? Is it like a, an ethnic uh, discourse or is it more like a the, the promotion of a political culture? Uh, what is the role of this uh, economic imperative, the heritage of Schumann? the leaven of Shema, is it important or not to justify the discourse on identity? And so in these cross-border regions, what is the reconfiguration of the national identity in the discourse of cross-border institutions? Is there like a, a supranational discourse to say to shape efficient oriented EU story decoupled from national? Do we, like, do we have instead like a post-national identity discourse? This is say a way to relate different national stories to define the post-national narrative? Or do we have more like a, a transnational identity really? A way to say that cultural <coughs> differences across national borders and we have to find brokers to bridge all these uh, sides of the cross-border region. Finally, uh, well, there is also about the uh, what sort of uh, group building is uh, promoted by this cross border region. <coughs> Do they promote differences? We are who we are because we are different from others. This is the Ipsis side of identity. Or do they develop like more similarity? We have like, a lot of things in common. <coughs> and what is the connection between the two, between the Ipsis and the Ida? And so what happened to the state border in the process of this designation of cross-border identity? Um, so do we go from one limit, separated limit to a line of interactions? Is it uh, a standing boundary which has to be transgressed, uh, eliminated? And what sort of borders is uh, emphasize the political borders, economic cultures, cultural 
borders. Now I will focus on the, the greater regions. So the greater region, as you see on this map, is centered on Luxembourg. We've got uh, four nation states associated to it, Germany, Belgium, France, and Luxembourg. We've got in Belgium the Wallonia regions. In Germany, you've got two lenders, Rhein, Pfalz, and Saarland. And in uh, Lorraine, you've got Lorraine, which is in France. So four states, uh, five political identities. In terms of culture, you've got like Romance countries, Wallonia and Lorraine. You've got German-speaking countries with German lands and Luxembourg between, in between Romance and German countries. And in this area, you've got a strong, long-term cross-border economic interactions. Since the late 19th century, there were a lot of uh, uh, capitals, economic capital crossing the border, the workers crossing the border, and the European coal and steel community really starting, was related to this area where there was a lot of coal, there was a lot of steel, and Robert Schumann was from Luxembourg, he was French, he has been German. So it is this area where the European coal and steel community was really thought about. And uh, in this area, there's, there's also been a process of progressive uh, institutionalizations since the 1980s. And uh, then in 1995, there was a, a new institution created called the Summit. So what I'm going to do now, what I've done, is to look at all the declarations of the summit between 1995 and 2019, this is 16 official documents of the greater regions in which developed a series of discourse. And I looked at the content of the discourse and the way they could mention the European identity of the discourse. So I, and I looked from it from different angles. First, what is the meaning of culture? What sort of culture is promoted to look like? Ethnic, cultural, political, something else? What sort of reconfiguration of the national is promoted in this discourse and the actions following this discourse? Then, what is the dimensions which is more or less promoted? Is it like the Ipse? Is it the Iten dimension of identities? And what happened to the border when they developed this official discourse? So, what we see, first of all, is the strength of the Schumann heritage in all this discourse. Um, there is not a lot of stuff on the ethnic heritage, uh, past, cultural of the greater regions. In the first declaration, they say, okay, a long, long, long time ago, there was a, a region called Lotharangi, and with uh, the son of Carlo Magnus, but that's what we are, and that's it, takes one line, then now it's, it's business as usual, it's just to say what we do now, and there's not a lot of things about the identity. They will mention maybe the, the industrial heritage of the cross-border regions, but also in one or two lines. So they don't emphasize too much the ethnic heritage culture of the greater regions. Uh, when we look at citizenships, the identity of citizens in the, uh, the greater regions, they've got a very specific way to look at citizens. Citizens are mainly workers who want to do cross borders, to work across the border. Um, people have to be trained. They're not really uh, voters. They can be youngsters who are promoted. Youngsters are the future of Europe, so they are young people, okay? But there is no strong thinking of the empowerment of the 11 millions of citizens living in the greater regions. It's more about workers crossing borders, cross-border workers in the world. And there is a lot of focus on the entrepreneurial. <coughs> this is, is a sort of level of colonization of cross-border collaboration by economics. Um, is it related to the fact that 
the Sahara has been strongly economy, economically integrated for the long, on the long train, and there is a strong Shumanian heritage before the ECSE, uh, or is it more related to the current Europe, which is really about strongly about uh, this kind of economic integration? It's hard to say, but the entrepreneurial culture of, of is really promoting. Uh, so what sort of uh, um, identity is promoted? Supranational, post-national, transnational? It's like at the European level. The greater regions is just a replica at a smaller scale of the EU. Um, they've got a supranational dimension. They've got, they've got a lot of singing about what sort of name we should get for the greater region. There was even a card to be won by somebody who could find a good name for the region. Uh, they've got a prize given to some people who develop projects uh, on culture and different sites. Then they've got this, their, their own secretariat, they've got the house of the greater region, they've got a the special day of the greater region, there is a special day for Europe, but there's a special day for the greater regions. So they've got, they've replicated what they've done, what has been done at the European level, at the le upper level. But it's also the same post-national dimension of building the uh, territories and people even living in these areas. There is this multi-level governance, turning presidencies like at the European levels. And they develop also a cross-national cross uh, commemoration, for instance, for the 100 years anniversary of the First World War, they develop like discourse about uh, how we connect with, we aware we belong to different nations, but we can think, we can recognize more differences and, um, through what happened in the past. And there is also the transnational dimension. The transnational dimension of the greater regions is about all these uh, economic and social actors create, connecting with one another. Uh, trade unions, uh, people representing businesses, and all the networks of experts, experts on different things, well, can connect to each other. They are brokers of the greater regions, all these experts. Do they develop more an ident or an Ipse identity? Uh, they uh, do two ways, the two exist. First, the greater regions presented uh, as a very specific part of Europe in a changing world. They, the world is changing around us and we, we, we have like a, a community of destiny. So we have to work together because we, got, we are different from the others. We, we, have, uh, we have to find our ways in the globalization and in Europe. And Europe is changing. And there is also uh, this European open identity uh, related to how can we be more connected to the rest of the world. We are different from the rest of the world, but we belong to like global European networks. And it's more about flexing yourself in a globalized Europe and a globalized uh, world. The greater regions uh, institutions also sometimes not in the declarations, mention sort of a fear factor. They say people living in Europe, people living in the greater regions, uh, they are scared or they are seeing going wrong because they have mentioned crisis taking place in Europe. But there is no real, uh, no opinion polls, no nothing to know exactly how Europeans living in the greater region really feel. It's just like suppositions or awareness of what the European public opinion is. But we see that there is progressively a stronger emphasis on police border control. That not every year, but sometimes it can develop long chapters which control more the borders because crimes is crossing the border. So what happens to the state border? Uh, when we look at all these discourses, we can see there is a dissociation. First, there is this administrative obstacle which has to be overcome for economic reasons. We should get rid of all this uh, complexity of administrations. We should 
makes things easier for business and for cross-border workers to cross the border. Then, indirectly, there is a new bordering, which is DevLock. There is on one side uh, mobile Europeans, and a lot of works of the Greater Britain Federation really to encourage people to cross the border through better training, through a better transportation issue. But there is not a lot of things for the static European, for the immobile Europeans. That is to say, for the 11 million minus 2 million of workers who, who don't cross the border on a daily basis, who can cross the border to, to go shopping on the other side, who can cross the border to go to cultural events on the other side. But culture or shopping or it's not really the center of the declaration. The center of the declaration is really how can we get a stronger economic integration with business, cross border workers, better training and so on. And, uh, and then there is a respected, a strongly respected political, ethnic, cultural state border. Um, the, the, the border is sort of a line of interaction between different national groups who recognize their differences and sometimes their similarities. If we look at how the greater regions mentioned the European capital of countries taking place in the greater regions, what we see that from 1995 to 2022 uh, with the ECOC of Esch, the ECOCs were mentioned in nine summit declarations. The first one in 1995 was mentioned only once, and it was only one example among other cultural activities taking place in the greater regions. It was really just one thing in examples, in brackets. Then we look at the 2007 Luxembourg and Greta region project, which was a cross border European capital of culture. Up to now, I would say the only officially official cross border European capital of culture which has been implemented. They say it's not just Luxembourg, it's what's happening around. And so this European capital is mentioned in seven declarations, and there can be very long developments in the declarations. Then we can see the ECOC of Mons, 2015, which is mentioned twice, not strongly developed. It was not cross-border. It was slightly cross-border because they wanted to create a connection between Luxembourg and Mons. You know, why it was done in Luxembourg, how it can be done in Mons. But say it's not developed. And because in Ash 2022, up to now, it hasn't been mentioned. When, when, we, look, when we look at Luxembourg Red Vision 2007, it was mentioned five years before the events. But Ash 2022, which is also cross border between Luxembourg and France, there is nothing which has been uh, mentioned in the declaration. So, if we focus on ECOP 2007, uh, what, what are the phases of identity designations across the nation which have been related to this ECOP? Well, first of all, there was a, a post-national dimension to it, in the way it was organized. They said, okay, each national side will be in charge of a specific topic, and then we've got a cross-border coordination. So, the way the governance, governance was put in place, there was a strong post-national dimension to it. Then, uh, when the project was finished, there was a willingness to create a, a supranational dimension associated to the economy. They wanted to create a specific agency with specific funds, and finally it was not possible because there was no money to, at the end to get it. But they wanted to use the interreg to get like a specific cultural associated to the greater regions and be disconnected from the other nations. And then they created this special day of the greater region after the ECOP. And in parallel, they developed sort of a transnational uh, identity discourse to create uh, web platforms with brokers, people dealing with the Web, uh, on the website to, to create connections between the different cultural and agenda located on different sides of the borders. And they even 
they started to um, create a retro region event within the German National Day taking place in, uh, in Germany, in Saarland. And they also use a lot of experts uh, on culture to be brokers for generations. But what we also see is that uh, culture is considered, when we look at this epoch, as a great doma a domain of great economic potential. Okay, they mentioned it's good for the sense of belonging, it's good to connect citizens, but what sort of citizens? Youngsters to create more bonds for youngsters. But it is not really assessed. But when we look at the vocabulary used, we talk about task force, we talk about quality brand, we talk about professionalizations, we talk about cultural industries. It's really there's a strong economic side of it. And the objective which is mentioned often is to say we have to create a, a brand for to be known in Europe and to to strengthen the creative economy. I'm not saying it's the only discourse, because there is also a discourse of like youngsters, the future of Europe, and, um, but the economy is a very strong. So, to conclude my uh, presentation, first I would say that when, if we want to look at the designation of the, the European identity in cross-border regions, we have to look at what sort of, uh, what is the ethnic and the political context within specific border areas? And so, what is the, what is promoted by in this cross-border region? Is it like Orban would do in Romania when he comes and say we are ethnic Hungarians across the border? Is there like a political integration which is looking at, looked at? It's something we have, we need to look at. We also need to look at the, the power of the functional economic integration in the past, in the present. I think that uh, that is a very strong explanation to to see how the greater regions develop all this discourse about the economy and the functional integration. There is this existing uh, functional integration, and that must orient the way um, we can consider what. What is the identity of the people in the greater region that are economic stakeholders because they are integrated? And um, we should also never forget that no cross border region is an island in Europe. There is a broader European context. And um, so it's always this willingness to see, to assess how a cross border region is compared to other cross border regions. Uh, for instance, if I think of Lille now, they mentioned that they were the first cross-border region in Lille to have an EGTC. They were not the second or third, they were the first. And then there were other cross-border regions that were first in something. So there is always this uh, a way of uh, being connected to the broader European evolutions. We don't know too much about the presentation of the European identity in Europe borderlands. What sort of uh, survey and indicators can be associated to cross-border regions? There's a lot of work to be done about it. Um, is a cross-border European identity related to a broader EU27 identity? What, what is the difference? What is the similarity? Um, when people present their, themselves, how can we characterize the Ipse and the Ident dimension? the dimension of their cross-border identity. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, the self-reflections. Uh, what is the identity crisis in Europe borderlands? As, as I said, initially, there's no identity discourse without really a strong crisis of identity. People saying, I am what I am, our people, they are, we are what we are. And uh, we look now, there is uh, the success of populist parties and so on in some European borderlands. So it means that there is an, an identity crisis in these areas. Uh, then to see that uh, European institutions, some cross-border lands, <coughs> like for instance the greater regions, we mentioned the youngsters, the mobile, the entrepreneurial citizens. But what about the other uh, citizens living in the cross-border regions? 
and this strong emphasis of the entrepreneurial culture on the youngsters can create a dissonance compared to the other segments of society living in these cross-border regions. And I think that the cross-border ECOX can be a way to potentially to create a new designations which can be more, more easily received by these, these mobile and invisible Europeans living in cross-border Europe. So, thank you for your presentations. And I, for each cross-border region and whether, uh, I don't know, for the French and Luxembourgish uh, border, the IPSE were more present in the summit documents or in the documents that you analyzed, or for the German-Luxembourgish border, it was another dimension more, more highlighted. Well, summit, it's a, a consensual document which is shared by all the national sides of the greater regions. So it's not possible to say which side has said something. There must have been debates, but they are unknown. Okay, but other, did you analyze other type of documents in order to get some inputs on IPSE ident dimensions? No, I mainly looked at the summit uh, declaration to, mm -hmm. to, to find out. And uh, they, they really uh, developed this, this um, idea that uh, they are in a network Europe. The greater region is a network economic Europe. And we have to get a greater cooperation to be stronger in sort of a neoliberal economic system. This is really about, and we must get rid of the state borders to get stronger and to be more competitive at the international level. So, so this is, but is it related to the current context of Europe, which is very strongly economically oriented, or is it related to the specific context where, where created the European core and steel community, plus the fact that there is a strong functional integration, stating that we have to, we are very good now, but we should get I mean, better and increase the wealth that we can share with one another. And in a very neoliberal way, because in all this declaration you don't see anything about the solidarity <coughs> between the different sides. There's no nothing about the transfer of uh, fundings on, from one side to the other to get a better balance for the public fundings on, on the other side. It's really about how can we help entrepreneurs and uh, young workers to be more able to cross borders and to create greater networks and to be more efficient for the economy. So thank you, uh, Christian, for your... For me, it was a very clear presentation of a subject I don't know very much. So I like very much the, the way you present the identity and the different kind of uh, <coughs> designation of identity, presentation of identity, and the self perception of self-reflection of the, the identity, and the way you, you use it to, to build uh, an approach uh, or kind of method to, to help us in our project to, to design or to investigate the, the issue of identity. So, for me, I think it can be used as a tool, to, as a toolbox to, to investigate this issue. So it's really fine for me. So I have two, two, one question and one remark uh, on the presentation of the identity. Uh, when you talk about the, the cross-border region identity, you, you ask which reconfiguration of national discourse we have to, to develop or build. But uh, 
I don't understand the, this question in, in a way. Why the, there is a need to reconfigure the national discourse? I don't know. The, the, the second point, it's more a remark, so, uh, it's linked with the, the border, more the border issue. Um, I have the feeling that the people now, they, they want or they, they need the, in a sense of a border. Um, the 30 or 40 last years, the, the elites of the EU, they, they developed uh, the idea of the, the borderless of Europe, we, we have to develop uh, a territory without the border. But now, I have the feeling that the people need the border, maybe linked to the, the identity building, because they, they need the border to define themselves or to define their collective identity. But maybe we have to investigate that in the future. Uh. national, but as soon as you got a cross-border or upper level institution above the nation state, you come up with discourse which are reconfiguring the, the national discourse, because it is uh, not a national institution which is producing the discourse. So whatever happens, if you are an upper level of the nation state, you come up with certain level of reconfiguration because it won't be just the view of one nation ab above the others and say we are all belonging to a singular nation mind which is associated to one nation but we have to connect these national stories and discourses and for that we got as we say EDA we have three ways the first way is to get like this transnational uh, or the post-national, supranational. Supranational is something which is, has been criticized in Europe. So why Europe, European institution, need uh, an England? Why do they need to get a special day for Europe? Why do they need to get uh, even a plan? But they just took up all the, sing all the symbols connected to nation state, and they just rescaled it at the other level. That is one dimension. And then the uh, the post-national, it is really about connecting and reflecting. And that is through these multi-level governments in which one day you are president of a structure, you belong to a nation state, but next day it's not you anymore. So you must always like adapt yourself to how you connect with other nations and later on you expect the other national president to adapt himself to the fact that you he was president once, but not forever. So you always came up with sort of a post-national, or you got the transnational, which is this Europe of experts, Europe of brokers, um, existing everywhere, like for instance the MOT, or who cross different borders, who, or even the researchers in Europe. Or in Europe. So you, you always came up with a, a reconfiguration of the national when you have discourses associated to upper level uh, institutions beyond the nation state. Concerning the, the need of borders in Europe, um, I, I think that it's, it's true that maybe there was always a need for a border in Europe, but this, um, this need of, of Europe appear now because there is a, uh, what they call the border crisis. The fact that some sections of the society from an economic background say there's a globalization, there's no borders protecting us anymore, and so all our living is collapsing, and there's nothing for us except if we build up again new borders. So there, this is one side. Then there is this, this uh, migrant fears, which is exploited by uh, populist parties and all the boss of populist now from Italy to Hungary. They say it's strongly related to this uh, migrant issue. To say that okay, there is this European conspiracy of bringing more migrants in Europe. So there is this fear of otherness, which is 
was not so important before the migrant crisis. Um, and as, as we know, there is this Eurobarometer about Schengen Europe. A lot of Europeans do not know that Schengen Europe exists. And you can you ask them after explaining them what is Schengen, they still don't know what it is. So there is this level of indifference by, shared by a lot of Europeans about this European integration. And um, so I think there was always a, a need for a border control, but which is strongly expressed when there is a crisis, and which is like calm down when things are like business as usual. It's on the regions, uh, even in the uh, in the requirements of the ECC, and then the case of Luxembourg and the greater region was quite different because it really was a large region, uh, larger than the, the state itself. Um, but how has has that region lived on uh, with this kind of uh, emphasis on that identity that was uh, uh, discussed in 2007, or are there? Sort of other kinds of regions and regionalism. So I guess the question here in Timisoara would be also that what is the region that we are talking about uh, in the case of the uh, European capital of culture? I think that if you take the, the greater region, you see the strength of the national in the post-national, if, if you look at the, the borders of the greater regions. Because the, the external borders of the greater regions is just the accumulations of the borders of the institutional territories of the greater regions. But then you've got like uh, the center of it where all this long term economic integration took place with the coal and steel industry along the borders of Luxembourg, Lorraine, a bit of Belgium, and a bit of Saarland. That's where things took place in the late 19th century and through the 20th century. There is also a bit of countries invaded by Germany, occupied by Germany, then occupied by France. It's always in this area that seems to be placed. And it's the same area where now there is this strong functional integration, where all the cross borders are living. So when the greater regions develop discourse about the greater regions, they cannot say we are discussing about one portion of the greater region. Is just a general discourse which is actually targeting this functional reality which is at the center of the greater region. So people may say, well, if you look at the map of the greater region, it's too big and it's not related to uh, a space of actions or a space of emotions or even the space of cognition of people living in this border region. If you are near the Flanders and, and if you are on the opposite side of Rhineland, that's the greater region for you, it doesn't mean anything. But he, if you are really at the center where there is this long term process of integration, it means some things. But the map that we have is just a map of this post national reality of uh, strong regional institutions built up by nation states, which are put all together. But uh, so there is a difference between the institu institutional greater um, region and the more historical and functional retribution in terms of size and scale. Yes, I have a question. Very interesting the presentation gives me a new <coughs> perspective about cross border identity. Uh, I have a question. Um, what what is your opinion uh, regarding uh, new identity in a if we have like an example, two countries, one is in European Union and one is not in European Union, like Romania and Serbia. If is appearing a new identity in this cross-border region of NATO, what kind of uh, perspective we can think for the future? Well, uh, Serbia is not European Union, so it's yeah, different. Yeah. I, I think there is this, uh, different scales of context. And it's true that what you mentioned in one scale is being or not being in the European Union. But I think there is also a regional scale or a cross-border context which is specific because if there is a Serbian 
uh, Romanian border, but you may have minorities, I don't know, of, of Romanians and Serbians on, on the opposite side. Uh, they may have like a, another common history of communist time. Uh, you must have other bonds on rich to uh, ethnic or political uh, characteristic in this area. So I think that the, the upper level of being or not being, I don't know if it can uh, really impact it. After it, what is important is what are the, the tools helping uh, people to, uh, to connect to one another. And uh, to, tomorrow I will mention this different tool of Europeanization. This is it. Our public policies within given nation states are getting Europeanized. And we've got three ways to, to do it. The first one is through legislations, all the reglements, all the laws. And that's what you say is being or not being. You are in it and got a series of laws to respect to it. Uh, the other, the second way is to, to create an identity locally, is to, is to look at all the different funding programs created by the European Union. And so, through the different funding programs, we got a know-how, how to use this funding. And uh, how you create a certain governance to use the funding, and then you create a public uh, way to manage this funds and also related to it different discourses related to the area where you are and why you use this money and so on. That's what happened with the internet. You've got this multi-level governance existing, but then you've got the discourse of justification, why you use your money, and then you can develop progressively an identity discourse about the area where you are in. And you try to find out in the past what were the ethnic uh, connections, what were the political connections, and the third way to get uh, more united in Europe in border regions is what we, is called the open method of coordination. And the open method of coordination is to transfer good practices, good ideas from one border region to the other one, or from one side of the border region to the other one. And this is also a process which is very strong in Europe with different type of networks like the Committee of Regions with the uh, MOT, the, the SESCI around Hungary and Romania across the border. So they've come up with a lot of uh, tool, uh, box of tools and practices for people to use. And if they use it or some aspect of the good practices, then they can come up with these ideas to create a new identity discourse in a given area like for instance Serbia and Romania for the regions. So it's a three processes and the long term context in the specific regions which can lead to new identity discourse in this area.